Hi, my name is Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive. Today, we're going to be taking a real close look at America's pharmaceutical drug litigation, and we have with us one of America's top firms discussing that, Girardi and Keese. Stay tuned. Well, some lawyers get so entranced with the idea that there's a potential $10 billion verdict mm -hmm. that when a mere several hundred million dollars is offered, they turn it down. If you live in an area that's infested with chromium or benzene or those sorts of things, you don't even know it's there. It doesn't smell different. It doesn't taste different. And the next thing you know, you see clusters of people getting cancer. Those are the toxic torts. Namely, those are victims of the manner in which somebody else disposes of stuff that really hurts people. The individual that, you know, looked at all these documents and then said, this drug is safe to give to 20 million Americans. They bear some responsibility, and it would take a special individual indeed to come forward and say, you know, perhaps I, I dropped the ball. There's a lot of talk about personal responsibility, yeah. but so few companies are willing to step up to the plate when it happens. continuing series about America's premier law firms, we have with us again, Girardi and Keese. Welcome to the show, Tom. Hey, nice to see you, Steve. You get involved a lot with uh, toxic tort cases as well as pharmaceutical drug litigation, which we're going to have some of your partners talking about that later. Define for our audience what toxic torts are. You know, give us um, some examples. Well, uh, you know, generally, if you're in an automobile accident mm -hmm. and break your leg, you know you've been in an accident, you know your leg hurts. If you live in an area that's infested with chromium or benzene or those sorts of things, you don't even know it's there. Yes. It doesn't smell different. It doesn't taste different. And the next thing you know, you see clusters of people getting cancer or clusters of people getting some other uh, serious disease, thyroid cancer, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And those are the toxic torts. Namely, those are victims of the manner in which somebody else disposes of stuff that really hurts people. Yes, they've been injured and that's when you step in. Sure. A lot of people approach you with uh, cases where they may have been injured. How do you, how does your firm decide which ones to take? Well, you know, you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money mm -hmm. making sure the case is meritorious. Yes. You know, these cases take, take an awful lot of money with experts and everything else to prove and to win. You mean an example? You had the Aaron Brockovich case. Sure, Aaron Brockovich, uh, we had $10 million of our own money in that case. You had spent $10 million before right. the verdict came in. Right, not with lawyer time, but yes. just writing checks as experts. experts. Right, exactly. You weren't being paid at that time. No, of course not. And I want to emphasize for our audience that you're a plaintiff's firm. You take cases on contingency. Sure. If you believe in the merit of the case, you'll take it on, you'll spend your money. Yes, exactly. Let me ask uh, you a question. You were right. known as the billion dollar gentleman, okay? A That's a nice thing to say. Billion dollar gentleman. I was reading this uh, not too long ago. Um, when the other side sees that you represent them, what do they think? Well, I think they think that first of all, we're going to treat them with total civility in our law firm. Yes. Uh, our law firm specializes in none of this nonsense of yelling and screaming and those motions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We try to cooperate. So I think that's one thing. They you mean, know. we will not see Al Pacino at your law firm yelling and screaming? No, no, <laughs> Al, Al didn't make the cut. <laughs> and then I think they'll also know that we'll be well prepared. Yes. We'll, we'll spend the money to get the right experts to be able right. to tell the story so the people have their best possible shot of success. Um, before we bring in your other partners, you brought up a point about treating people civilly. I understand that you're a graduate of Loyola. I am. Law school. I am. And I understand that you have a building named in your honor over there, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we, uh, we uh, raised some money and built that building. Yeah, but I understand that you teach a course over there. It has to do with trial ethics, is that correct? Yes, that's true. Tell that us a little bit about that. You know, I've been able to garner some of the finest trial lawyers from across the country mm -hmm. that are in organizations that I'm in, uh, mm -hmm. the International Academy of Trial Lawyers, yes. the, the Inner Circle, and we bring them in and they talk about ethical things that they're confronted with in trial or in the trial practice. 
we had the Chief Justice come, uh, yes. Chief Justice Ron George. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a small class. We limit it to 24 of the students. And I get more out of it, obviously, than the students do. But there's, the there's, there's the a purpose behind the thing, mm -hmm. isn't there? Sure, there's a purpose. There's a purpose. There are two things you need to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. One, you got to understand the law. Number two, you have to know how to present it. Let me, let me ask you this question Go because ahead. you're a plaintiff's lawyer. You know as well as I know. We'll talk about the Ford rollover cases. The automobile companies, and I don't mind saying this, I can be sued, not you, right? The automobile companies hide things sometimes. You know, remember Dick Nixon in his case where he, there was a crime committed, but the cover up is always worse, and that's what they pay for, right? Sure. My question to you is, how do you think the corporate lawyers feel when they know there's documentation that exists that you have to get some which way or whatever? How do you think, do you, how do you define that as ethical? Let me tell you this, there are some companies out there that give you those documents. Yes. Honest to God. We make the motion, in come the documents. Just out of nowhere. Right, because they, they <laughs> produce them. No, they produce them and yes. they know it's bad but nonetheless for them, okay. but they produce them. Yes. Um, but there are some that that's are That's more the exception. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, more yeah. the exception. There are some I mean. that are famous for hiding them, preventing you from getting them, and then when you do get them, they will show up with a dump truck, you know, with 10 billion documents, right, oh, and no. dump them all on you, right? Right, and because they don't think you're going to read them. Yes. And we read them. So when getting back to Loyola and your course on ethics, is that the message you're trying to send to the new lawyers you know, do this in an ethical manner. No question about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no question about it. And quite honestly, uh, there's a lot of personal success in being ethical. Yes. You know, all of a sudden, if the, the other side knows you're going to do the right thing all the time, they give you a lot of credit for that. Do they? You settle cases uh, for a lot more money. Really? No question about it. Good, good. Well, we are going to bring some of your other partners on here. So we're going to bring them right now. Well, Tom, you brought one of your other partners, Howard Miller, in here. And welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. Always a pleasure to be here. Both of you handle toxic tort cases. You handle appellate court cases. Um, tell us a little bit about the toxic tort cases and the environmental cases that you know, your firm is handling. You know, we have them all over the country. Uh, every one of these cases starts with a company disposing of stuff that yes. hurts people uh, without protecting the people that it's going to hurt. Yes. You know, it's very expensive to properly dispose of chromium, mm -hmm. benzene, all of these uh, all of these chemicals that can cause so much damage to people. It costs them more later on, though, right? Well, if they're caught. We, we hope so. That's the plan, if they're caught, right? Let me bring out, there's a case that you're involved with, I think, the Greenpoint case, right? Right. And you're involved with, is Erin Brockovich involved in that case, too? You know, she was. Uh, okay. Matter of fact, some of the people in Greenpoint went to Erin. Oh, okay. And that's how we got involved in the case initially. And I understand over a period of something like 20 or 30 years or something like that, oil has spilled out... Is that correct? Oh. Something like 30 million gallons? Millions of gallons of oil. And Mobile was aware of it before. When they merged with Exxon, um, they've been aware of it, and this case is going on. Which brings up another point. Let's talk about the Valdez spill. Okay, how long ago was that? 20 years? Yeah. I understand that Exxon was given a judgment that they had to pay $5 billion. Now, that's been back and forth between the Supreme Court. It was knocked down to $4 billion, four and a half, whatever. I understand that Exxon has only paid $100 million of that $5 billion. Right. This is 20 years later. It shows you that large corporations can have the staying power. These people who were harmed 20, 25 years ago yes. are yet to see a nickel. It's okay. now going back up an appeal again on the ground that legally they can't be uh, have punitive damages assessed against them. Well, wasn't that uh, wasn't that an issue before? No. It, the amount was an issue before. Now it's been reassessed and it's going back up again on the general issue of whether at all there can be punitive damages against them. They're fighting payment of any dollar yeah. that they can fight. Now this is a, this is an aberration. This is an exception. Most companies end up paying. PG&E paid three hundred and what thirty six million dollars. Right, the first time, and then and another. the second time, which was just recent, wasn't it? Right. And now, why was there a second part of this, which was another three hundred or four hundred million dollars? Right, and that was a different site. 
Oh. Uh, the, the plant was located in a different place, but indeed, they did exactly the same stuff. So there. my question, PG&E is a big company. Um, Exxon's a big company. Why don't they follow the same MO as Exxon and not try not to pay any money at all? Because Girardi and Keese was not in the Exxon Valdez case. <laughs> that's a good point. That's a very good point. These companies can, can stretch it out. Yeah. But now as a, as a law firm, you have to have the ability to understand the case. Yes. You have to have enough money to hire the good experts. Mm -hmm. You have to have enough trial ability to try the case, and then you need the appellate lawyers that can stave off. That's uh, where Howard comes in. That's my smart guy. Yeah. Well, and you need one other thing that Tom has more than any other lawyer in the world, yeah. which is the ability to know when to settle and when to fight. Yeah. You know, some lawyers get so entranced with the idea that there's a potential $10 billion verdict mm -hmm. that when a mere several hundred million dollars is offered, they turn it down. Yeah. It's Tom's ability to know when to settle the case and what's realistic, amount. right? Sure. And the timing. When is yeah. the right time? This ability to know when is the right time to get the maximum amount. That's a key skill here that very few lawyers have. There's a lot of lawyers that are going to be watching this show. So I'm going to ask this question on behalf of them. What makes a great trial lawyer? I think uh, on the plaintiff side, uh, somebody who really cares. Huh? You know what I mean? You've got to know I don't your subject. You can... You've got to know your subject. You can't fake this. But how do you address a jury? You address them like a real person, right? Of course. Well, jurors now, Steve, are every bit as smart as you are. Yes. Man. You know, it, they it, watch Law and Order, don't they? They watch Law and Order. <laughs> they got all that down. So yeah. when you try these cases, if if there's some questionable evidence, some bad ev evidence against you yes. in the case, you have to talk about this to the jury. Mm -hmm. You can't pretend it isn't there. Bring it out before, before the other side brings it out. You want to bring it out in the way in which probably is a little more favorable to you. You have a huge advantage with so many years' experience. Tried so many cases when you're up against a law firm that has corporate lawyers, a lot of them haven't seen a lot of trial experience. Not a, the number of senior yeah. litigators yeah. in large firms that have never had a jury trial yeah. is just amazing. Yeah, you, have, you have a firm like Skadden, yeah. they have some real trial dudes yeah. over there, man. They can, they can try the case. But they're an exception. Most of the large firms really haven't tried that many cases. I hear this word misused a lot, litigator and trial attorney. Oh. Yeah, I, I see that. The reaction. worst thing. The yeah. worst thing you could call me. <laughs> you never call me a attorney, litigator. Right? God <laughs> darn it. Litigator yeah. is a guy that works outside the courtroom, right? <laughs> right. And filing a bunch of unnecessary motions. Why do they call them litigators? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not trial lawyers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. What are some of the cases, like the Greenpoint case? What are some of you talked about one in Simi Valley? What's sure. going on in Simi Valley? Can you talk about it? Sure. Uh, Simi Valley radiation exposure to people. Okay. Uh, we have numerous. Uh, Radiation, I should say this, uh, can affect the unborn fetus. Yes. Affect the eyes of the unborn fetus. Mm -hmm. We have 13 children who are either blind in one eye or blind in both eyes. Wow. That live in this very small area. Yes. You know, no question caused by the radiation. After so many years. After of so many. Trying years. these cases, okay. Mm -hmm. It still gets your get you upset when you hear about these things, right? I can hardly wait to get there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Seriously. Honestly, I mean, if somebody buy the gas, I do it for yeah. nothing. Uh, we don't wait a minute, wait a minute. Ah, <laughs> careful. <laughs> careful. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, it hey, is. Lindy, uh, I'm going to have, um, I'm doing a show later uh, today with Gloria Molina, the board of supervisors. Sure. Okay? One of the supervisors there. And I saw a show with uh, Huell Hauser. Uh -huh. And he was talking about the San Gabriel watershed over here, right. which is polluted from, I don't know, JPL or whatever. Right. Are you guys involved with that at all? We were involved in one segment of that. Yeah. We got our cases settled. Yes. But the problem is not resolved. No, it's, it's got this huge water, you know, uh, the size of Lake Tahoe, you know, underneath the ground over there that's all polluted, right? No question. A bigger problem is the PG&E problem because that chromium that Your they, favorite people. My favorite people. <laughs> the chromium they dumped is yeah. now within 100 yards of the Colorado River as it migrates towards the river. How can they physically stop this? Or are they, are they trying? Are they doing it? Yeah, they thought they would maybe put in a cement wall underground really? or something like that. Was Robert McNamara involved with that? I'm just kidding. No, no that, was <laughs> Donald, reason, that, that, that was Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. The reason I bring that up is because you remember in Vietnam, uh, he wanted to build an electronic fence around Vietnam to keep the enemy out. Right. You know, so I was to build a cement wall. How deep does it have to go? Well, it have to. It have <laughs> to go down. It's not going to work. I mean, this is a real problem. Yeah. Because once the stuff is there, you really don't have control of it, or it goes after that. Yeah. 
And so all this dumping at the PG&E plant. So this now, is going to affect a lot of people. So what, like your law firm is aware of this. Sure. PGE is aware of it. What is being done? Well, they are having some hearings uh, on it. Uh, we're not actually, we don't have a voice in this, yeah. in this fight as it currently sits. I'm going to ask you a personal question. Sure. Do you drink bottled water? I absolutely drink really? bottled water. Are there anything yeah. else? More importantly, there... Erica only drink, yeah. drinks it. Well, you it. actually have a clinical test going on right here because I only drink tap water. So that... <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> no, supposedly the water here in L.A. is supposed to be the best water in the country. No, something. I think so. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't want to say something uh, bad against L.A. water because, in all honesty, it's gotten pretty good reviews. No question. 20 years ago, I think it was 20 years ago, uh, Bayer Aspirin uh, had Tylenol that was laced with cyanide. Right. The CEO immediately, and he's considered the gold standard in this, what he did, he came out and he said, he, with, he pulled out 31 million bottles of cyanide off the market. Why aren't more CEOs doing that? And don't tell me the bottom line. You know what? Um, what happened to ethics? What happened to ethics? Here you are, you've gotten to the top of this company. Yes. You got to the top because you were smart. Yeah. You knew how to make good decisions. Yes. And it seems to me that most people probably want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Once they get to the top, now you have a problem. And instead of coming forth, uh, look at the way uh, Chief Bratton came forth uh, yes. the, uh, last week, two weeks ago, yes. with respect to the officers that did mm -hmm. the wrong thing. They did the wrong thing, we're going to blah, blah, blah. You know, right, no cover up, no nonsense. Might add, but it, it also, came forward before the mayor. But it also has, it also sure. has to do with the way chief exec, the change in compensation for chief executives. Yeah. You know, one of the best examples of this is Merck. When Roy Vagelis was chairman of Merck, mm -hmm. Merck was considered the most ethical company in the world. And as a matter of fact, they donated vaccine for river blindness to Africa. He made an international so reputation. So stock options, isn't it? It's stock, it's moving away from compensation. Too many people, whatever industry they're in, are just in the yes. stock option business. Get the options, get invested. Let's talk about out. one last thing. The companies make a mistake. They're penalized. They pay money, you know, like PG&E. There was a decision made high up by an executive who caused these problems. Why aren't they prosecuted criminally? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, suppose, you'd like to see that, wouldn't you? I think so. And you know what? Yeah. A couple of those prosecutions mm -hmm. would end it. Yeah, absolutely. It's one thing at the end of the day, here, here's the money, forget yes. about it. Yes. Because it's not their money anyway. It, no, and money's easy. Yeah. If all of a sudden somebody was faced with 30 days, one of these chief executives, 30 days, you can share the cell with the murderer. Ms. Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> but if that was an option out there, Yes. Believe me, there'd be a whole new ballgame. And we've got a real-life test of that, because, you know, in the area of copyright law, the executives of companies that violate certain copyrights are they're personally stealing. liable. They they're are stealing. Per and they're personally liable. Are and, they? and if you track under the copyright law, and if you track those number of infractions against infractions in other areas, you see the effect of creating the personal Good. liability. That's what they should be personally responsible. I want to thank both of you for being on the show. You know, I want to thank you, you know, to uh, be able to tell this story so that people understand a little bit what the trial lawyers do is really important. Yeah, and, it's a tough job, and a lot of people don't realize that. They all think that, you know, lawyers are money-grabbing, hungry people, but that's not the case. You brought up in the Aaron Brockovich case, you laid out $10 million out of your own money, and that is without paying your lawyers, right? That's right. That's just on experts. That's just on the, the mechanism of the trial. So I want everybody to understand that. You guys are great. We're going to have you back again. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Steve. And two more partners of the great law firm, Girardi and Keese, are Paul Sizemore and Jim O'Callaghan. How are you? Good. Good morning. Thanks for coming here. You guys primarily specialize in pharmaceutical drug litigation, right? That's exactly and right. And I understand you're handling a variety of cases which include Vioxx, correct? Yes. Bextra, right? Yes. Uh, peanut butter. Peanut butter? <laughs> Am I correct there? That's right. Tell us a little bit about peanut butter. When I saw the list, I said, well, that's not a drug. What's going on? We've got about just under 300 cases, Steve. And what this involves is one particular make of peanut butter has been uh, indicated by Which this. Which one was that? It was way? Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Uh, the CDC has actually pointed out one particular factory in mm -hmm. southern Georgia that was infected with a very rare, I call it bug, but, uh, in infection, Salmonella, Tennessee. Yes. And it's a, a, a very damaging uh, bug if you get it, and it can actually result in the loss of life. Really? Absolutely. Have there been anybody that 
died as a result of eating peanut butter? Absolutely. A very good friend of the firm, as a matter of fact, died. Of your firm? Absolutely. Of your firm? Absolutely. A very well-respected uh, Midwestern you attorney. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich? We have the two cans, they're jars, of peanut butter, and they've actually been tested and shown to contain wow. this particular bug. That is very much personal involvement, isn't it? Absolutely. What, it is. what's, what's the status of this case? Uh, there, just last Friday, there was a big hearing in front of the multi-district litigation panel. Yes. And they're trying to determine what particular judge is going to handle this nationwide litigation. It'll be focused in one particular side. How many cases do you have here? Just under 300. So if anybody's watching this show and they've eaten peanut butter, what did the reaction, what's the negative reaction that they have gotten so that they might want to call you? Well, we're, we're only looking for the, the, the very, you know, or the uh, more injured spectrum of yes. cases. A lot of people have eaten the peanut butter and maybe had one spoonful and had some gastrointestinal or stomach upset. But there are a lot of people out there that have experienced prolonged hospitalization, uh, blindness. Can the doctors death. nail it down to eating this? Absolutely, they, they can. can. When they test you at the hospital, they'll actually run a scan and they'll find that it's salmonella. The problem yeah. is that the uh, CDC has actually pointed out that it's one particular rare type of salmonella and the hospitals generally don't get that specific because why would they? Right. They know you've got salmonella so let's treat it yes. and go from there. Now without getting into the details, what is Peter Pan, the company, what's their position on this? Well, we'll find out after the MDL is established. We're hope Wouldn't hopeful. it be nice if someone stepped forward and said I'm sorry? Wouldn't it? There's a lot of talk about personal responsibility yeah. but so few companies are willing to step up to the plate when it happens. And that's one of the things that I want to get into with talking with you. You hear a lot about pharmaceutical drugs out there that are you know, they have problems. I mean, every time you buy one of these things or see it advertised in the magazine or newspaper, there is another page on the back that has print that is so small, it takes a magnifying glass to read it, and it has all the warnings, but people don't understand that. Are there any safe pharmaceutical drugs out there? Well, I, I think that uh, the drugs that have uh, been around for a long time, long enough that they're in a generic form, are mm -hmm. probably the safest drugs because they have tremendous uh, history behind them, mm -hmm. and we know that they're safe. In talking about some of the, we brought up some of the cases, Resolin. Tell us what that drug is. Tell us what are the health effects uh, of taking that drug. What are some of the negative health effects? Well, I, I think the, the Resolin litigation, which is uh, it's pretty much wrapped up at this point, but it's an example of the failings of uh, the FDA with respect to monitoring drugs and the need uh, that consumers have to uh, have lawyers who are willing to undertake lawsuits uh, yes. when they're injured as a result of drugs. And Resolin was a, a drug given for uh, type 2 or adult onset uh, diabetes, which mm -hmm. resulted in liver damage and in some cases uh, liver damage leading to death. Wow. What about the Vioxx cases? There's a whole lot of them. There's, um, what, 23,000 of them nationwide, I heard. I read someplace. Double you, it. You guys are the lead counsel, your law firm, Girardi and Keys, lead counsel in California, right? We're lead counsel in California. Uh, Paul is very involved uh, with the MDL Vioxx litigation as well as the Baxter and Celebrex uh, mm -hmm. litigation. Paul is involved in one of the first trials of Vioxx uh, in the MDL yes. uh, and uh, is very involved in the Cox II litigation yes. uh, nationally. Here in California, uh, our firm uh, serves as liaison counsel for all of the uh, plaintiff's lawyers who have cases filed in California state court right. against Merck. Let's talk about the, um, the FDA and the role that they play in protecting uh, the consumer. The role is questionable, isn't it? Well, it, it would be better if there was a stronger Speak honestly, role. Honestly, yeah, if there was a stronger role. Yeah. You now, Steve, most people don't understand that the FDA doesn't test drugs. Yes. What it does is, well, let's take the Vioxx example. Yes. There were about 500 crates of documents brought in containing 500,000 documents that were given to the FDA. Initially. Initially. Before it was approved. Before it was approved. Okay. Now the FDA, they didn't take the uh, substance Vioxx and test it on individuals or animals to see if it was safe. They just looked at those documents that were could, provided by the, the company. Could they come back and say, we don't have the staff, we don't have the money, we don't have the facility to be independent testers? Well, there's a, I don't want to say CYA, Steve, but yeah. this is a bureaucracy here. And you've got to think that there's some personal responsibility. Sure. The individual that 
you know, looked at all these documents and then said this drug is safe to give to 20 million Americans. Mm -hmm. They bear some responsibility and it would take a special individual indeed to come forward and say, you know, perhaps I, I dropped the ball. I'd also like to point out though that there was material that Merck had, information that Merck had, questions that Merck had themselves about the safety of Vioxx. Yes. And that information wasn't provided to the FDA by Merck. And I don't think it's uh, fair to entirely blame the FDA. I think Merck, Merck bears the overwhelming responsibility because they were keenly aware yeah. of the dangers the drug could This pose. brings in another point I discussed with Tom and Howard, which is you're talking about the personal responsibility of the corporate officers. Um, I think Tom and Howard both agreed that if you saw some of these executives who ended up doing jail time, because they are essentially responsible for the death of people, aren't they? If they're aware that. of this information, they're not revealing it. Now, my question to you is, how can we change our society so that these people are personally responsible? How do we do that? I think we've seen a good first step here with the OxyContin litigation. Mm -hmm. We've seen a, a lot of the actual executives responsible for the, the deaths and the, and the folks getting addicted to this drug have been indicted. Uh, in the Vioxx realm, we've actually seen the Department of Justice the SEC conduct investigations, mm -hmm. and we're hopeful that we'll see the, the type of, of uh, actual responsibility from these executives that we've seen in the brokerage industry, in the yes. accounting industry, et cetera. It should be no different. Are there attorney generals of certain states that are mo moving this forward? There are, and the, the attorney generals are doing it both on a civil and a criminal basis. E. coli, you see a lot of problems with, you know, fast food restaurants. We're not going to name any names here, but, you know, you're involved with some of these cases, aren't you, too? We sure are. What type of cases are you involved? Well, actually, one of the more interesting cases that we have is, is a case that uh, involves the, uh, a grower who was wrongfully accused uh, and you're by the parent. you're representing him. And we're representing him. He was uh, uh, wrongfully accused by Taco Bell and its parent company yes. that somehow uh, he was responsible for providing tainted yeah. food and it wasn't true and it's a yeah. it's a wonderful family owned uh, farm company that's been in business for decades. Uh, I love that about your firm because you look for the truth Absolutely. and you represent the people. People would think well it's easy to uh, you know sue this lettuce grower okay or this <laughs> onion provider or whatever okay but you're actually representing him because you know the truth. And that's, uh, the, the truth isn't our guide, then our work means nothing. Yeah. Well, you've done a great job. Continue the great work that you're doing. We're going to have you back on the show again. It's been a pleasure having both of you on here. And just so we can reiterate where we can get more information about your website, it is? www.girardikeys.com. And your telephone number where you can call both of you is? 213-977-0211. Thank you for being on the show. We're going to have you back again. Thanks for watching our show. We'll be back next week, and you can watch more of our shows at www.insiderexclusive.com. Thanks again.